And a special order for one of my minimalist wallets with uh, without plastic in the card window, which I think is a brilliant idea. And using this wax cord and the natural colored uh, veg tan leather. So that's what I'm going to put together today. Probably won't take very long. We'll see how it goes. These are the pieces I need to cut out. Two interior pockets, the main part, and the outer ID window. I'll switch the voiceover now as I go into high speed. So I'm finding uh, scraps. One of the nice things about a little wallet project like this is I can use all the leftover scraps from bags and, and other things that took uh, big pieces of leather. So I'm able to you know, use as much of the leather as possible. I don't like to throw any of it away if I can avoid it. Yeah, like I said, this this particular um, this particular project needed uh, uh, veg tan leather. Didn't want any dye or anything, just the natural color. I'm trying to be clever here and cutting the window pocket out around one of the brands. So there's actually a mark here on the leather where a number was, uh, I think, branded into the animal. And so I'm going to cut that part out of the middle. A little foreshadowing. It didn't work right, but the rest of it's doing okay. I'm getting my pockets cut out. I'm trying to match these because they're pieces from different hides and they're slightly different textures and things. So I'm trying to find pieces that match up well and will look coherent in the final piece. This is a relatively simple design. It's nice because it uh, will last a long time and it doesn't take up very much space. Wallets that have a lot of pockets are really hard to get thin. I'm going to work on that more over time as I progress in this craft, but uh, for making really thin, easy things right now, the simplest thing is just not to have a lot of pockets to stack up the cards and money together. So I'm using the Aussie dressing here to waterproof it all. It's, it's easier to get everything done up before you put it all together and stitch it. This helps to make the inside smoother too. So I'm just uh, getting it all dressed up so that it won't uh, take any water from you know, if it rains and you get water on your pocket, or sometimes you, you sweat you know, when you're out, you don't want to get the wallet all messed up. So, making it waterproof is better. That stuff's got to go in and sit for a little while. It's not like a snow, snow seal where you have to heat it up, though. You can if you want to, and it'll penetrate a little bit better, but you just have to leave it for a few minutes and then go back and uh, wipe, it, wipe it all down. I put the cardboard out because the newsprint was actually starting to transfer onto the leather some uh, through the wax and the Aussie dressing. And so the cardboard gives a nice neutral uh, neutral substance, substrate for doing that work. And then uh, to give it a little bit darker of a tone and also make it more supple, I, I gave it some Neat's Foot oil. Some people might need to put it before they put the waterproofing on, but the need foot should go through that and the waterproofing should stay okay. It's wax. Now I'm, I'm using, after I've gotten it oiled up a little bit, I'm just giving it a little bit of a crease where the wallet's going to fold. If I really wanted to do it right, I could have wet it down and, and folded it and left it folded, but um, that would require a lot of work. You end up having to worry about the water stain not matching everything when you're done if you're not going to tie it. Here I'm doing the edges, got to bevel and burnish the edges that won't be accessible once everything's assembled. So you got to bevel them and then go in and sand them smooth with the veg tan so you can actually burnish it. This was the first project I did after I got my uh, craft tool burnishing uh, tool. It's an electric uh, focus for burnishing. So cutting inside corners is really difficult. On this first try, what I did was I used a um, hole punch to punch out the inside corners and then cut between them.
Gotta sharpen up my knife. You gotta have a really sharp knife for doing this if you don't want it to mess up. I could have used a box cutter with a replaceable blade, but I was feeling like using my little tiny knife that day. There it goes. It's actually really a hassle to get in and buff those inside edges too. I'm not a big fan of these kind of windows, but if people want them, I can, I can do them. I actually learned a lot in this process. I end up having to toss this first one. As you'll see in a little bit. So here I go over to the burnishing tool. And basically you just put gum tracanth on the edges you want to burnish. That helps to uh, soften up the fibers and make them respond a bit better to the burnishing wheel. You can do this by hand with a hand burnishing tool, which I've done in some of my other videos, but it's it's nice to have this power burnisher. It's basically just a buffer that has a hardwood wheel on it with grooves the right size for the different leather types. And you can just get in there and uh, burnish them. Basically what happens is the friction of the hardwood against the leather causes the, the leather fibers to kind of melt together and make a nice uh, slick solid edge that looks really nice and, and resists abrasion and lasts longer. You can't do it with chrome tanned leather though. You can only do it with veg tanned leather, but chrome tanned leather has, uh, it tends to stay together better on the edges if you get a nice sharp cut with a knife. And then you can also dress the edges of chrome tanned leather with uh, leather paint. So I've done that in some other projects subsequently, but um, the traditional way to do it is to use veg tan and then burnish the edges. You can see trying to burnish that inside edge with the tools is not working. I'm going to end up having to do that by hand. Which is a little bit of what you see happening here. You can also use uh, burlap to burnish leather edges. So that's what I'm doing is I have some burlap I use for this burnishing project. Uh, burnishing job when I, when I need to. And then getting some more of that uh, leather dressing to fill in the corners where I had the and stuff. Then I'm trying to finish it off because it's really hard to get those inside edges. I'm putting some beeswax on there because sometimes you can burnish on the beeswax and it'll help to solidify it and make it a little bit nicer. That's what's going on here. I don't know. Some people really enjoy edge burnishing. I find it to be one of my most frustrating parts of the leather crafting project. I, um, I'm always looking for ways to, to get to not have to do it, <laughs> to do something different. Okay, so what I'm doing now is cutting on a new window because it turned out that the previous window was too, the, the opening was too big. I had designed it originally with the idea that there would be plastic inside to hold the identification in and you could see the ID through the window. But what happened was uh, when I didn't have the plastic, that window opening was too big and the ID would just fall out. So that was not, not good. So what I've done is I've used my own driver's license as a model here to figure out what size I need to make the new window. And I'm cutting it out uh, of this new piece. And instead of doing the hole punch for the inside corners, I'm just being very careful and taking the knife right up to the inside corner to get it uh, cut very precisely. Because you don't want to go past, you'll end up with a little nick there. I got it to do. Yeah, and lots, lots more burnishing. Lots more burnishing. Burnish, burnish, burnish. Getting all those edges nice. Of course, since this is a new piece, I have to go ahead and give it the Aussie, so it'll be waterproof too. There it goes. Rubbing it into the inside corners. That's ready to go. Once you put that uh, waterproof dressing on there, the leather won't take the contact cement as well anymore. And so you've got to rough up those edges even on the uh, flesh side of the leather. Usually you don't have to rough up the flesh side to do contact cement, but if you put stuff on it like that, you do. 
and here I'm roughing up the, um, the outside of the leather <coughs> again to get the contact cement to go. This was right after I'd gotten my big contact cement pot. Man, that thing is worth it. If you're doing leather crafting and you're trying to decide whether you should buy one of those pots for the contact cement, the answer is yes. Yes, you should. Makes the whole process so much easier. If you're not doing leather crafting every day, though, the contact cement will dry out in there unless you um, get kind of sloppy and actually run the brush around the opening to create a seal when it dries out. I didn't learn that for a while and ended up having to uh, put a bunch of solvent into my contact cement to get it to rejuvenate. Here we go. Hammering the pieces together so the contact cement will take. You can either use a, a roller to put high pressure on it or a hammer, but the fact is that the contact cement doesn't really settle until <coughs> it's been pushed together with high pressure. And then another trick, I try to always remember this when I'm cutting pieces out, but if you make the pieces for the pockets too big, then when you put it all together, you can cut them off and get a nice, really smooth edge. Much easier than sanding is if you cut them too big to start with and then cut them down. I'm cutting the groove in so that the stitches will lie down in the groove. They look much nicer. It covers a multitude of sins if you go ahead and set the groove because as you poke with the stitching all, um, it stays inside that groove. So even if your angle's a little bit off, the stitches get pulled down and they look more uniform. So I would say that if you can groove it, you should always do it if you're hand stitching. Here goes the hand stitching. I'm going to go all the way around. By doing it this way, I only have to do one line of stitching that just goes all the way around the leather. You can see how the stitches are looking nice and lined down in those holes. And you can si see a little bit here the prick marks from the spur that I run around to mark where the stitching holes should be. I'm not just like hitting these stitches dead on uh, freehand. I've got that stitching wheel to mark them so I know exactly how far apart to, to set them. Although, if you do this long enough, you get the muscle memory and you can kind of do it without the marks. Marks make it easier though. You actually kind of feel them with the awl. Just drop the awl right into the mark and then boom, make the, make the stitch. I find I'm a lot faster hand stitching now than I was at the beginning. It just takes time. If you do it enough, your fingers get so they understand what's going on. So you can see here I ran out of thread, so I had to make another one to make it to the very end. And I tied off the old one while I was stitching just so that it wouldn't come undone. Once you get everything stitched on top of it, and you, you know you back stitch over it, then you don't have to worry about that end anymore. You can cut it off. So it's done. I can cut those ends off, cut the end off from the first thread, and I'm done. Yep. This is a um, nylon thread, so you can actually melt the ends down. That helps to secure them. So they don't come undone. Although they pretty much never do anyway. And then if you really want the stitches to look nice when you get done, you, you go through and you tap them down with the hammer. That makes them lie down in that groove and they look really slick. Now I gotta buff, buff all the outside edges. First step is to get them evened up. So I'm using the sanding drum side of this to, to even everything up. I did cut them flush before, but I could still use a little bit of that. Now, you can't see it off, it's off camera, but I was going ahead and pre-rounding the corners with a knife. It makes it easier to do this part where you're rounding them over with the sanding drum. So you cut them with the knife so that they're kind of angular corners, and then you can round them to make them smooth with the drum. Now I gotta go back and I gotta cut the bevels in with my beveling tool. It's always hardest to get around those edges where the pockets go. I'm not beveling the middle part between the pockets. It's too thin to really 
work properly. And come back, this is about 400 grit sandpaper. And just sort of smooth it out a little bit. Makes the um, burnishing part go faster. Okay, so now here I am burnishing those last edges to get it to look nice. All right, there you go. One little minimalist uh, card wallet. Spot for your ID to go here. I had to make the window a little bit smaller, so I'm gonna do two tries, because there's no plastic. Didn't want the card to fall out. And uh, yeah, I guess I should, I should sign it. I used the new burnishing machine on the edges and they came out actually really nice. Super smooth, so they're not gonna fray. They'll stand up to a lot of, uh, a lot of wear. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give me a like. Uh, if you wanna see more like it, go ahead and drop out and subscribe or click the little subscribe button that'll show up on the screen here. Uh, if you got some ideas about how I could do things differently or questions about how I did it, uh, leave me a comment below, okay? Let me know what you're working on, too. And uh, thanks for taking some time. I appreciate it. Bye.